Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in from here at the Floyd Country Store. My name's Dylan Locke with the Floyd Country Store and the Handmade Music School. And uh, we've got a really fun evening for you, and we're so happy you're here with us. Our good friends, uh, Mac, Shay, and Jackson, uh, some of our favorite human beings, our favorite musicians, and definitely our favorite luthiers. Um, this is the first in a series that we're gonna start featuring uh, our instrument builders, the people who make such beautiful instruments and, and uh, really make it even more fun uh, to play music. Is, is, uh, and also one thing that we uh, enjoy here at the Floyd Country Store and the Handmade Music School is, is celebrating great traditions. And, and these three guys are, are just really um, embracing that like nobody else. And uh, we're grateful for their work. So you'll see um, another um, showcase coming on uh, this fall that we're gonna put together with some more great luthiers. So stay tuned for that. Um, Want to tell you about how tonight's going to work. We're going to, of course, hear some great tunes um, from these folks. And then also we're going to ask you all to ask some questions. We've got our friends Gina Dilge and Lindsay Terrell uh, here that are going to be moderating. And they will be um, taking your questions. And um, we'll get some answers from these gentlemen here. Um, also, I uh, ask you to go check out their websites. We're going to be putting those links on the website. Um, so go check out their websites and, and buy an instrument. They're all ready for you to come knocking and, and buy some of these great instruments. Um, so we'll be putting that up there. So we're going to start off tonight uh, with some music, and then we'll move on to uh, the rest of the evening. So thank you so much for being here, and have a great evening. How about what y'all going to play first? Oh, we're going to play the Angela and the Baker. Nice. <laughs> is I just actually hired somebody to make me a banjo one time and I had it for a while it was sort of a Gibson like banjo and then I got into old time and wanted something kind of different with the open back and thought well shoot maybe I could make one and I had some wood available to me that I could use and was inspired by an old banjo that I had gotten at the, during that time period that had some bird's eye maple on it and so I just 
set my mind to go about trying and I uh, thought I could do it and, and my first banjo came out fairly good with some help from a booth here in Vermont when I was up there and I got a commission after that it's like well I can make another one and sell it to this guy and that'd be fun to make a second one and I went on and just got a few commissions as I went along in those days back this was back in the late 70s early 80s and so I made a number of banjos back then but I'd always been inspired by other people that made instruments like I went and was visited shops of uh, Olin Gardner was a guy that made banjos in this area and uh, Wayne Henderson made me a guitar actually at that time and I was just kind of sold on having handmade instruments and I wanted to uh, make that a part of my life is to be an instrument maker and banjos has been the only thing I've really made the most of but uh, thanks to Jackson I made my first guitar here during the COVID time so I'm kind of interested in that now and uh, it's just uh, something I'm always looking to try different woods and tone rings and, and experiment some with my work and I think I'm looking to forward to trying more guitars too so uh, it's a great thing for my life anyway. Yeah, so so Mac, you're from you're from Floyd County, Virginia. Yeah, yeah, I live about a lot of people from town here. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people know that, but not not everyone. Um, and then next we have Shay. Thank you, thank you for uh, having me here. It's quite a pleasure uh, and a privilege. Uh, my name's Shay Garrick, and I am a violin maker. Uh, probably let's see I'm thinking I'm working on my 32nd and 33rd violins and I've been making violins for about 10 years now I started out uh, doing repairs I took a repair workshop and learned details of violin repair and violin setup and from then on I kind of just taught myself how to make violins based on what I already knew about wood and using tools and how the instruments are made and and how they sound or at least they should sound and uh, that's my story pretty much I've learned from whatever sources I could get from other people other luthiers books videos and especially taking apart old violins uh, that I think really sound great and look great and trying to emulate the workmanship in those instruments um, and then uh, Let's see, regarding music, uh, I started playing music around here when I was 19 years old and I spent about 15 years in the Blue Ridge here learning, learning old time music from old timers and people like Mac. Mac actually got me started playing fiddle uh, back around 1985. You're my old timer. Yeah, <laughs> Mac's a real old timer, that's for sure. I'm proud of it. And, and you, uh, you live in Pittsburgh, North Carolina. I live Carolina. in Pittsburgh now. I live in North Carolina. I moved to North Carolina in 1998. And I have a violin shop there. Uh, I've been running for about 12 years. Um, I sell uh, new and used instruments. I have lots of uh, restored violins uh, that I've worked on over the years. And then I have the violins that I make uh, that are for sale there as well. Uh, so do violin rentals, bow rehearing pretty much the whole nine yards so thanks Shay. that's my story in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> yeah and from joining us from Grayson County we have Jackson Cunningham mm -hmm. my name is Jackson Cunningham I live in uh, Mouth of Wilson Virginia and um, I like to just say that it's a it's an honor to be here and to be up here with these guys and um, be at the Floyd Country store and um, I guess I these days I kind of build mostly kind of old reproduction guitars from the 30s, 40s. Um, I kind of got my start building fiddles and um, banjos. Some, I think Mac helped me out on a few banjos back 15 years ago or something. And um, so I mostly learned, I grew up in a household where there's a lot of woodwork and a lot of music and um, always kind of Figured eventually I would kind of, you know, the two would come together and I would start building musical instruments. And um, so I kind of just learned from folks in the community, 
and um, there's a lot of people down in Grayson County where I live who really just um, were super helpful just to share information and um, share their time and 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 be excited that somebody came along that was wanting to learn this stuff and um, so I feel pretty fortunate in that way um, just you know luthiers in the music community and stuff so um, but yeah, yeah. Now I pretty mostly mostly focus on guitars these days. Um, I got a fiddle on the bench, and uh, might get into a little bit of banjo making. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's. And uh, and but, would probably want to mention during this uh, about the guitar that you're is is that the the guitar that yes. we are yeah, currently yeah. running a raffle for, and tickets are still available until June tenth. You can win one of Jackson's handmade instruments yep. to support the Handmade Music School. I Absolutely. don't know if you want to say anything about that. Yeah, this well, this actual guitar here is the one to um, be raffled. So I'm going to try not to scratch it up too bad during our little jam session. But it's just a little old Gibson kind of copy. It's um, an L double O model, and um, we got about a week left to do uh, tickets. So go to the website and get you get you one. Great. Well, the, the, the way we've designed this evening to work is a uh, great conversation with these three luthiers, as well as some great music from them. So I think while they kick off another tune, we would love to hear from our audience what kind of questions that they might have for each of these. So, um, and, and they could be anything from, I think we'll talk a little bit about influences and inspirations. Um, and if you have any burning questions, we'd love to see them in the Facebook comments here. And Shay, do you, uh, or Mac, you want to kick off another tune for us to keep us rolling? Sure. Want to do the last string? Yeah, let's do that. If you're up for it. Yeah, this this is a tune that uh, comes from one of my fiddle heroes, and I know Mac as well, is Taylor Kimball, who was from the Lower Fork area. And uh, he was kind of a, a wonderful fiddler to me because he he had a quite a bit of melody in his playing. He had a lot of notes, but he also had a driving character to his bowing. So it was kind of the best of both worlds and in a lot of regards. So uh, I've always loved listening to him and Mac just picked out one a little earlier. I had forgotten that I knew uh, that, uh, that they played. That would be uh, Taylor and Stella, his wife, who played the banjo. And this one's called Lives of Jane. Somebody uh, I've also heard it called, called the New Cut Road. And then I've yeah. heard it called Big Liza as opposed to Little Liza. So it's just a different kind of Liza. Anyway, yeah, Taylor put a kind of a little twist on it on the B part um, that I always like. So here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
that's so great. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Um, I think some of them I think we'll get to in the course of the night. So if we don't answer your question super right away, it might be because we feel like there's going to be a, a good spot for it to land. Um, I think it one of the one of the questions is about wood sourcing, um, but I think we'll start off the the conversation a little bit with. Uh, inspirations for how you got started. I know a lot of you talked about um, how you started building, but are there are there anything that kind of gave you the shine that, that made you want to start building instruments or people that you really liked that you learned from or inspired by? Um, well, I guess, can you, can you hear everything pretty good out there or should I grab this little mic over here? Use this it's all coming, the audio coming through pretty good. I guess okay. Or should I use? We'll the okay. Um, basically, well, I guess I would have to go back pretty far. Um, I kind of grew, like I said, I grew up in a in a house where um, my stepdad was a woodworker, and um, ever since I can remember, there was piles of sawdust all over the place and um, saws and chainsaw mills and all sorts of stuff like that and um, he had a wood shop and about the coolest thing ever was to go out into that wood shop and hang out in there and um, and music was always around and um, and so I remember being a kid and being kind of I think we had a, the first electric guitar I ever got. I got banished out to the wood shop, and so I'd, we'd sit out in the wood shop and play. And um, so I guess just like I was probably inspired in the beginning, just kind of being around, being around music and being around, um, being around wood and all that stuff. Um, so um, I think I kind of knew I wanted to build instruments for for a lot of years before I finally started. I had. I had several projects, um, guitar projects that I started on, but I think it wasn't until I moved to Grayson County when I was introduced to Audrey Hash Ham that um, somebody, like just having somebody that like kind of believed in you to like be like, oh man, I can do this, you know, like I can, you know, and made you think that you could do it. And like when you went up to visit them, like you came back feeling like whatever you did was like, worth a million bucks like it was something it was pretty scrappy the first couple fiddles I made but you know when you got done you just really felt really proud of it and stuff and so um, so Audrey kind of really got me started to where a point where I knew I could actually do it um, you know I think just the musicians and the music was an inspiration just um, most of what I make is inspired by the you know the music I like and the musicians that that um, play those instruments and stuff and um, so I built fiddles for a number of years and then um, I kind of wanted to build a where well, I wanted to I like Carter family so I wanted to build an L5 I wanted to get an L5 but I couldn't afford one so um, after realizing I didn't have twenty thousand dollars to buy an L5 I was like well if I build fiddles I can I can probably carve out you know just bigger plates right you know like yeah. I got all the carving tools and stuff like that. And, um, so I started getting into guitar building and I lived right next door to Wayne Henderson and his shop and kind of that scene of, of, of guys coming by the shop and um, just, you know, just constant exposure to instrument making and, um, and um, you know, people come from all over the place. and. And so between Audrey and down there, and there's a guy named Don Wilson too, kind of, kind of helped me out in the beginning and um, helped me with the guitars and um, and just was really, you know, people who just kind of, I mean, I think sometimes it takes somebody just to believe what believe in you, and what you can do, and get you going. And so those guys really helped. Um, Mac was a big help. I come up to his shop, and I think when I first moved to Virginia. I had was looking for fiddle lessons, and I come up there, and they said everybody go up see Mac train them. I called him up, and he's like, "Well, yeah, you can come up to the house, but 
um, you're going to have to cut firewood for me. And <laughs> work study. <laughs> so it um, seemed like a fair deal. Um, so we went up there and cut some firewood, and um, he gave me fiddle lessons and stuff, and um, that kind of turned into a regular thing, going over there and playing music and stuff. And he helped me on banjos. I think I built four, four banjos or something. So, um, yeah, yeah, just I think inspired by just a lot of people in the community. I think it's just, you know, it's there's a lot of people willing to help if you're interested and want to put the effort and the work into it. There's people, people around that that would really, um, really enjoy it. Yeah. Pass it on. I guess I'll go next. Sure. And, and you don't have to feel like you have to go in order. I mean, it can be more of a conversation. I'll go ahead and go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, if get you it out of the way. Um, <laughs> well, as I said in my intro, I started out uh, with violin work, uh, taking a repair workshop. Uh, the reason was because I had started a music store, and I needed to learn how to to work on violins. So um, it just became something I had to invest the money into and the time into uh, just to make my business better and to offer more services. So I took a workshop under Chris Germain, who's a really well-known American maker, and came back to my store and started doing repairs. And uh, it wasn't long after that, um, somebody asked me, like, do you make violins? Like, uh, no, I don't make violins, sorry. <laughs> and then somebody else came in the store a few days later and said, you make violins? And I was like, no, I don't make violins. And after the third person asked me that, I was like, I've got to learn to make violins. Mm -hmm. so, so at that point, I just started gathering all the information I could about violin making and uh, looking for sources of wood and seeking out patterns and uh, getting all the tools I needed like thumb planes and scrapers, things like that. And gouges, I bought a nice set of gouges and just went at it. And I made my first violin in 2011, I think. And I sold that violin about three months later and had already started my second one. And from then it's just been the most fun thing for me to do in my life. Besides play old time music with my buddies. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm hooked. And I'll probably be making violins as long as I, I can, which may not be that much longer. I don't know. <laughs> At least 10 more years, I think. Um, so as far as my influences, I would say Don Leister in Richmond, violin maker in Richmond, it was probably... Um, encouraged me more than anybody else. He, he looked at my first violin when it was still in the white and said, you're doing great, keep going. You could do this a little better, this, you know, kind of stuff like that. And he played it, and, and uh, he was my biggest influence, I think, as far as getting, moving forward. And then I'd have to say the main influence after that are just anonymous makers of violins that, I come, that come through my store. And if I come across a violin, somebody brings it in for repair or... Um, or, or I buy a violin from somebody and I really like the way it sounds. I like the arching on it. It's a good craftsmanship. I'll actually, if I own the violin, I'll, I'll take it apart and uh, find out the stiffness, stiffness and the thicknessing and the details about the work, the carving, the uh, edge work and so forth and try to copy that. So I would say most of my influence comes from violins that are already made that I try to copy and learn, like emulate some of the handiwork, the tool work uh, with. And also with working with uh, plate stiffness and thicknesses, graduation patterns and things like that uh, are a big part of that. Uh, you can learn a lot from graduations just by taking violins apart and taking detailed measurements mm -hmm. and uh, finding out where the tap tones are and things like that. and 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 use that as a guide of how to move forward. And every violin for me is, it's a, it's a learning experience in its own self. So uh, that's my story. Thank you, Shay. Yep. <laughs> All right. 
Well, I didn't grow up around any shop. My dad didn't do any kind of wood work or craftsmanship, and so I didn't have anybody in my family to look up to that, that way. But uh, I guess just in the early days when I sort of got turned on to something being handmade, thinking uh, it's got to be better. Somebody made it all and controlled the processes of that instrument. So that's when I had gotten this friend of mine to make me a banjo. It was a kind of Gibson RB100 copy. I didn't watch him make it, but he did a good job and had made himself one and didn't intend to make more. And I talked him into making me one. And then I was on a quest for a guitar, wanting some kind of a better guitar than the Yamaha I was playing. And it played a Martin some and thought, this is not really nice, a whole lot better. And kind of went looking to buy a pre-69 Martin, something with Brazilian rosewood in it. I got turned on a little things about the years being different in, in guitars of that brand. And uh, not having any success, somebody turned me to Wayne Henderson and said, well, Wayne can make you a pretty good guitar. And then I played one he played and it felt as good and sounded as good as any Martin I'd ever tried to that point. So I kind of got on his list and bugged him for six months with postcards every week. Like, it's hard to get a Wayne Henderson guitar at that time. But I finally got it. And so I was proud. I had two handmade instruments, but I hadn't made them either one. But eventually uh, I got into playing the open back and wanted to try to make it like I mentioned earlier. But I've always been attracted to wood and the beauty of wood and putting wood in, beautiful wood into an instrument is something that means a lot to me. And I see lots of beautiful wood and other things in banjos. And this banjo here is one that I made recently that's got a beautiful piece of wood that Scholar can show it or not. But, uh, so I'm always kind of looking at wood and uh, if there's a way I can obtain a piece of specially nice wood, I'll do it. And I th think I did a little work for our, a relative who had a wood pile and I went through and found the board that made this banjo in Canada and uh, been very happy with it and thought that this is as good a nice curly maple as I could have found anywhere and uh, yielded me enough wood to make four or five banjos with it and uh, other wood I like to get local wood if possible too. I've had wood that was grown in Floyd County that was uh, I've gotten in, in some way sawed by somebody just right off their sawmill. There's some other bird's eye maple I've gotten where I was actually there able to get it right when it was being sawed into boards and take it home and dry it. I've even gotten wood from my own property when I was doing some fence work. I ran across a nice big dogwood tree that I uh, remember my acquaintance Kyle Creed had wanted dogwood for his banjos and he made, made very fine banjos and today they are very treasured by people that own them. And dogwood was one of his favorite woods and so I, I was like, well, I want to make a banjo out of this tree here and did what I could to get it made into sizes that could dry and, and dr dried for several years and I worked it up and got it into a form where it could dry even more and be closer to the final dimensions and gave it another year and try to stabilize it and, and so I'm very proud of the banjos I've made out of dogwood not that many only three I think is total I've ever made because it's a rare wood but it's a common kind of a mountain wood and so I, I kind of like stories to go along with the wood and an instrument like nobody might know that in the future but if, if I pass the story on maybe it'll go on with the banjo to whoever passes it along but it's always nice to have a uh, little ways of getting wood that you don't have to go out on a, and do a whole lot of big uh, ordering from long distances and not know what you get just kind of happen on to. So uh, the, that's there's a question too. I'll point at you, Mac, which is uh, what your favorite banjo setup is. Set up as far as uh, tone ring head. Okay, that's a fair question. Yeah, banjos have a lot of variety and things when it comes to uh, 
the works and, and what makes the sound. And uh, I've generally, my, the majority of my banjos have had simple tone rings, which were rolled brass, which is a rod of brass rolled into a loop and left unattached, but fitted under the head and under tension as you tighten up the head over it. And, uh, but neither of the banjos I have today are that type. I got special tone rings in these two banjos and I'm just don't necessarily have a favorite. I'm just liking to hear and compare the differences at this point and let other people try them. But this banjo in particular has a Dobson tone ring. And if you study banjo history, you know that there was a maker named Dobson and there was lots of people in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 20th century patenting different ways to put things under the head that would enhance the volume and the tone. And this banjo has this particular thing. Let's see if Skylar can show it. And it's just a, a unique kind of a sheet metal thing that's available now, new, from some of the suppliers. We were lucky to have suppliers out there that make the parts. That banjos have so many metal parts, and I'm not a metal worker, really. I can make those simple tone rings and do a lot of just roll in the brass from and buy rods and make my simple ones but then some of these specialty tone rings I have to purchase them and this other banjo over here has a, a tuba phone type tone ring in it and I'm experimenting with that and it's different from this one but it's they're both good and I don't, couldn't say one's better than the other they're interesting to compare I enjoy I'll, that part of it. Yeah, I'll point another question at Jackson, and then it would be great to have some more music. Um, mm -hmm. I've gotten this question twice, which is um, a particular year of L O that you uh, kind of strive, or are maybe more inspired by, or, or strive to kind of emulate. Um, yeah, uh, this, I kind of, um, 1933 is kind of a year I've been kind of focused on. Um, just some folks in the guitar community have kind of pointed me that way. There's some special things about the 1933, and um, you know, it's an earlier L O, which seems to kind of be the preferred. Um, you know, these they were a little bit lighter built in the early 30s than in the than the later um, 30s. So I've kind of zeroed in on the, the 33, and it might not be exactly um, everything 33, but it's got like the solid vine, uh, linings in it, and it's built real light, real light and responsive, and it's got a, um, it's got a little bit wider neck on it. Um, but I can do, you know, I can kind of zero in on any era, really, but this one in, in the in the last couple I've done have been about 1933, yeah. And you don't do repair, someone asked that too. Do you have oh, any well, repairs I, in your I, shop? Um, not professionally really. I mean, I do it you know, a little bit here and there, but I don't advertise it. I'm too busy to to go down that road. It's kind of a, a different mindset, I think, doing a repair versus the new build, so. Thanks, um, you guys have another tune for us? Yeah, we could do that. Do you want to do that uh, C tune? 14 days in Georgia. All right, all right. Let me switch bands. Uh, this is a tune that, um, at least for me, and my fiddle influences. Uh, there's there's more than one. Uh, most they're all from this region. Uh, Ivan Weddle would be one who played this tune. Taylor Kimball, and then uh, what was that fiddler from the the Blue Ridge Highballers? Oh, the name. I know he's Charlie LaPrade. LaPrade. Yeah. yeah. So those are the three that I've heard play it, and uh, it's called 14 Days in Georgia. Yeah. This is kind of like uh, like Ivan would have played. It's just two parts.
sounds great. Um, a couple more questions, and if anyone else has uh, questions to put in the comments, um, we will gladly take them. Uh, this one from Chris Purcell is interesting. Um, how have your shop setups changed over the years? They evolved. <laughs> yeah, I think mine has. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, well, I've moved spaces before, so um, my shop got smaller at some point because it's basically like a carport that's framed in. Um, but I think as you kind of go along, you get used to, you. when you start out, you just start hoarding all these tools, everything you can get. Like you're just people tell you this, this, all these tools, you get all these gouges, you know, planes and tools. And, and eventually you start to realize that you don't need but a certain, or I do anyhow, like there's so many trusted tools, you only need one of each, all these things or whatever. So I've got like all the, I've kind of zeroed in on just, you know, everything being convenient within reach or within walking distance and kind of the big shop tools on one side and hand tools on the other. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think you just, as you keep doing it, and um, they just kind of evolve to be more convenient and more, um, I don't know, you set up to get things done faster. And, um, but, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, my shop's kind of in a in-between stage now because I was doing cabinets and furniture as a career up until last year or so, and so I've still got a I got a pretty spacious area, but I'm not happy quite with the way it's is from the old career, and I want to try to get more efficient and make some more better use of my space and set my tools in a, in a different arrangement but uh, it's still working for me I mean I just sometimes I have to set something up and take it down and I don't have as much dedicated machinery as I might tr be trying to look to do that more yeah I would say my shop is it's changed locations and I've gone from having one shop to two I have one at home just for building and then the other shop at my shop, my retail store, Man, nice. is just, two shops. yeah, two shops, <laughs> is just for shops. customers' right. work. And I found the reason I got to do that is because if I go to work, I'd rather work on my violins and make my violins and work on somebody else's or rehair <laughs> bows. So I found myself getting behind my, my work. Um, so I had to separate the two out because of that reason. It's um, like having two separate businesses, because I think of the three of you, you're probably the only one that does kind of professional instrument yeah, repair. That's right. And violin, my violins are just a small part of my overall business. Um, the other thing is that it, my shop has gotten smaller. I've moved to a different place, and now it's a quarter the size it was before, and that's actually better. Hmm. Um, and But it hasn't got any more complex. I still... I have a drill press, a bandsaw, and a bench vise, and all my hand tools. And um, I don't need any more than that, really. Lots of clamps, of course. Uh, the hardest part has been trying to get two sets of tools. I was taking them back and forth between my house shop and my workshop, yeah. and so now I'm slowly trying to double up everything, like it's double up all my time. clamps and buy more uh, gouges and um, things like that. So you have to kind of wait till the money comes available and you can invest in a new set of tools. Uh, we had a question kind of on the, the instrument repair, but the kind of maintenance side, but what is the kind of the most common uh, problems that you find in instruments that, that people bring in that might be able to be um, maybe prevented or otherwise kind of helped? Some, should I take that one? Got uh, you're the repair guy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, there's definitely something that falls right into that category. And I feel guilty saying this because I used to be a, I used to keep my fiddle cross tuned all day long and for the whole year in any, any kind of environment. And of course, after a few years, I couldn't play it anymore. Uh, Went the wrong direction. That's probably the biggest problem I have cross is, down is necks that have dropped significantly. 
um, because of high tension on the strings, being in uh, really, like real high humid and higher temperature environments like Fiddler's Conventions. And uh, that happens all the time. And then coupled with that seems to be fingerboards, ebony fingerboards that are too concave. They have too much scoop. So when you're playing, well, just say in the first position, you have to really push down far on these strings to make them too much stop. Relief. It's too much relief. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times when people get grooves and the uh, from the strings, they'll some luthiers or repair people will just smooth out that region of the fingerboard and it just kind of cuts a little gouge in that region. It makes it worse. Whereas the whole fingerboard needs to be planed at that point. So those are my two really big big problems I would say with fiddles. Right. Recommendations for care. How about for banjos or, gu or guitars? Do you guys have recommendations for care of instruments? Um, well I don't really do repairs but I'd probably I mean I would guess the most common I mean people ask me a lot most common thing is just set up stuff you know neck resets you know um, bridges you know Gibson's is bridges and stuff and a lot of braces coming undone um, frets at work of course um yeah i mean i guess the just try to take care of your instrument don't leave it out in the sun or leave it out all night or something um there's certain things that just going to naturally occur if you play a lot yeah. like f frets getting flat spots in them and grouches from fingernails so cut your fingernails might be a good thing and uh play lighter <laughs> but uh you can't help how you play but it's just a fact that you might have to put some money into repair and then just because things happen. Humidity is a big yeah. deal, mm -hmm. especially around here when you get, you know, just seasons. Um, just, you know, stuff drying out is an issue. You know, a lot of stuff cracks from just getting dried out and staying dried out for weeks on end. Um, you start seeing a lot of cracking like February, the end of winter. You know, stuff's been dry all winter long. It's always good to be able to maintain, look at your instruments occasionally and see if your bridge has gotten knocked out of whack or check your tension of your head. That'll change with time over years and I often get calls, something might be rattling and I'll say, well, tighten up the head and then sometimes it fixes it just because uh, it's just normal wood movement occurs and things loosen up as you kind of break them in and play them. There's nothing unnormal about it, but you can prevent going to the shop sometime by keeping a look at things and, and uh, knowing how to set up a banjo has a movable bridge, kind of like a fiddle, so knowing how to keep that in the right spot is, is a good thing. And changing your strings just depends on how much you are bothered by old strings. <laughs> Sometimes they'll change themselves if you break enough of them. Um, and yeah, thanks. Mac and and, um, and Shay both brought things that they have on our table over here. Um, and I wonder if you guys want to show any of those off and say anything sure. about it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go first, Mac? Show my little stuff. I didn't bring a lot, but just. making banjos by pre-made rims but I never did that I wanted to make the banjo all the wood parts and making the rim involves having curved pieces of wood that have to be put into a form and laminated together and there's a lot of step to that and it's hard to get into that in this kind of a setting but uh, this is what I started out with a board out of the same tree that banjo with the maple neck this is the same wood from the same tree, and I ripped it into strips, flat, and a thickness stem with a thickness sander I have, and went through a process of uh, bending the wood to get it into a loop form like that, so it's already close to what it's going to be when it's finished. But I was, I don't remember how I first got turned on to how to do it, except in the end, uh, my, I was around Kyle Creed some, in his last days and some of his 
shop got distributed out by his wife and one thing I was able to obtain was this piece of heavy cast aluminum and this is what he used to bend his wet pieces of wood after he had boiled them in a trough of a gutter and so I got some of my method of how to do that was from knowing what he did. I didn't really observe him doing it but I talked to him some about what, what he did and, and this is something he had made to get really 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 hot and using gloves and being in his shop set up he could take the wet strips of wood and literally get them really limber and roll them into loops and then let them dry he even said he'd put them in the oven sometimes just to dry them faster so he could get to work with them. So Dan then in my shop on the coldest days I can think see coming up because it takes a lot of heat to do this. I have a wood stove and I have this on the wood stove just heating hot hot and then I got boiling trough of wet strips of wood that are this wide and oh they're about five thirty seconds thick and then it's just a process of taking this iron off to a spot and rolling the wood around on it and letting it kind of get limber and turn into a piece of chewing gum almost and, and kind of loop it up and put a string on it and let it dry and it'll hold that form. And so I make all my rims, four ply rims with uh, nice pieces that sort of match the neck on the very outside and a, good clear piece of hard maple on the inside and use hard wood as I can to help resist a lot of the forces. But uh, let me go back to over here just I didn't bring that much stuff but uh, this is just a fingerboard that's got slots in it that's rated for frets. This is actually a, a, a man-made material that was developed from recycled paper and it's very uh, dark when it's stained, when it's oiled it turns jet black, kind of like the ebony wood that so many fine banjos have on them. And I don't use this exclusively, but sometimes I do, because I had some access to some scraps of this and was able to make boards and slot them and have a, them at my disposal to make uh, certain banjos and use this for the fingerboards. And it's, it's been pretty good. I've, I've used rosewood and I use ebony and I use some other exotic woods. And then uh, this is just a sample of a short little banjo ukulele neck. And this is some of that dogwood that came from a local source. This wasn't from my property, but it's... Anyway, this is going to be glued together with a strip of colored veneer in the middle and make a piece that's wide enough to make a fingerboard. And then it'll be developed and developed and turned into something kind of... This is a little baby banjo and uh, maybe it'll grow a fifth string maybe it won't <laughs> but anyway if you can see there's a stripe up the middle and then that's where I've laminated a piece of contrasting color to help uh, accent the joint some people could just glue something together and it's wider and it works but why not celebrate things with color sometimes is what I'd like and then it's trimmed off with the uh, same paper stone material in this and uh, I just like to do a little decorating with inlays and uh, my daughter sort of designed that little shape there Hannah Trainum and so she's been helping me out with some of my design work for some of that and but they're functional things the little dots and things on fingerboards of uh, fretted instruments and uh, so I try to make them playable and, and functional and, and practical and even make my own bridges. You can see that little bridge there. That's kind of a, something I started doing in the last few years. So I have bridges available for my banjos and for other people to, to have. So anyway, I think uh, I'll turn it over to Shay. Okay, I brought up the makings for two violins that I've worked on simultaneously. It's the first time I've done that and I kind of like doing it. Uh, I start out, um, well I'll just show you this first. This is this is a spruce top. This is European spruce. Uh, this particular one I think is over 30 years old so this is 1995. 
uh, it's quarter sawn and then it's been resawed down the middle. This will get opened up to book match and then this will be glued together. Now the maple's a little different. This is a one piece back. Um, this piece was a lot thicker. This piece was probably this thick at this end. And so I sawed down uh, just to have a working piece. Got rid of a lot of the extra wood. Beautiful. Yeah, this is beautiful maple. This is a uh, this is European maple. It's probably about ten years old. Is it already laminated? Is it already glued together? No, it's one, one piece. piece. One piece. Yeah. Laminated. Um. This is a Magini copy that I've started. It's in the mold still. Uh, so the garland is all done. This is uh, ready. Uh, to have the back put on. I glue, I glue my backs on as soon as they're done and then I take the mold out and and I'll show you uh, what I've done with this one. This, you'll see why. Um, but anyway, and then I've got two necks. I used to hate making necks so I'd start them first and I still start them first but they've gotten a lot easier. This is my Strad neck. This is going to be my Magini neck. Uh, let's see. This is a this is the same source of spruce that I showed you before. This has been roughly graduated, and it's about to have the f holes cut and put in. And then once that's done, I'll put in the base bar and do the final uh, tap tuning and graduations. And this is the back. That this is all completed. This is a one piece maple back. All the edge work is done, the purfling is all done. Um, I'll flip it over. The blocks have been trimmed and the lining has been uh, installed and trimmed. So this one's pretty much done, ready, just waiting for the top to be put on. And that's it. After that's done, the next will go in and we'll start the varnishing process. Thanks, Shay. You're welcome. Um, since, uh, since Jackson doesn't have any of his kind of rough stuff to show off, he does have another guitar that he's brought with uh, him. And um, you can talk about that, and then let's uh, play some more tunes after. Okay. Uh, first, I wanted to um, go back to the earlier question of our uh, first influences and stuff, but I wanted to give a shout-out to my mom. It's her birthday today, so um, without her and growing up in a household where art and music was encouraged, this wouldn't have been possible. So just um, happy birthday, Mom. So um, this is just another example of a guitar I make. It's a SJ copy, Southern Jumbo. And it's a bigger, bigger body guitar. And it's my personal guitar. And it's, as you can see, it's been kind of abused. You broke it in. And uh, <laughs> it might need to go to the repair shop. Um, <laughs> Don't take it to beat. <laughs> but it's uh, it's um, kind of based on the 40s, Gibsons. And um, yeah, I don't know what else to, it's just kind of different sound than L double O. Mahogany, spruce top. Oh, I know what I could say. This top right here is red spruce that I cut on top of um, Mount Rogers. So this spruce kind of grows in our in our backyard, um, high elevations. This was a blowdown that um, came down in Grayson Highland State Park. And I was working at the park at the time and um, cut this piece of wood up. So I thought that was kind of cool that I got to cut something, you know, basically from the ground up. It's just a it was just a tree that had blown over in a storm and I'd cut it up and let it sit for, I think I cut the tree in 2011 and um, I built this in 2015. So I let it sit for about four years. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Yep. That Where do you get great. your fingerboards from? Oh, I, wherever I can get them. Um, this Brazilian rosewood, I, you know, people 
people have them, you know, you might get them online or something, or you run across people who want looking, to trade and looking for it. that type of thing. I got a question for you. That down tree. Yeah. How big was it? And I mean, how old was it? And did you just take part of it, or were you able to get it was, several logs to? Um, yeah, I took, I got anything that was usable. I yeah. got a whole bunch of, um, I built, I don't know, I probably built five fiddles out of this tree. No kidding. And I've got a bunch of tops. I mean, it's harder to find a fiddle top for red spruce, you know, because it's just a dense, mm -hmm. harder wood, so you don't want something that's got a bunch of compression grain and that type of thing. So you want a really lightweight spruce, especially when it's red spruce, because it's so dense. But yeah, I think I built a handful of fiddles out of this out of this wood and um, it had blown down and stayed down for I think a, it stayed down a, a season or something so it had some bugs and, and stuff in it but it was big enough to get guitars which is really hard to do yeah. you know that was luck mandolin pieces wow. are a lot easier to get but to get something that was close enough to the road and you know get it before it got chopped up or rotted or something um, Getting in the right place at the right time is yeah. important yeah for getting your wood yeah. and uh, if um we've recently completed a, a whole documentary on jackson's kind of the building process of the last guitar that he built for the raffle um that is happening we're doing the drawing for the raffle next friday the 11th and you can still get tickets for it on, until the 10th through the 10th and um and we're going to drop the link to that um to that documentary in the chat if you're interested in seeing more of jackson's uh process his workshop um, and a lot of that is really well done. We're happy to have it. Um, and I'm going to throw out this last question um, from Gene Parker asks about the third string. The D string on the fiddle seems to be the weakest string. Do you um, have any thoughts on that? Uh, I would say look at the setup. Look at the setup. Yes. Great. Usually to me when it when it comes to the in intrinsic Weaknesses of violin is the E. That mm -hmm. is the weakest usually. It usually comes from having a th too thin of a top um, or just a really big volume inside the instrument, uh, which tends to support more lower frequencies. So that's been my experience uh, with violins. Is, uh, the hop that I've got there, they're really hard to get the E's right um, to where they're not too weak and they have enough power to to be even with the other strings. But if the D is weak, I would look at the setup, um, the bridge location, the sound post location, especially the set of the sound post, and uh, that it's really fit well inside the instrument. Yeah, great. Well, um, thank you all so much. Um, we'd love to hear some more music. What do you think about two or t tunes to take us out of the evening? Sure. All right. So we've got we've got for for everybody this Mac Trainum, Matt Shay Garrick, Shay Garrick, yep. and Jackson Cunningham, and uh, we are so thrilled with this event that we would like to do another one in the fall. Um, there are so many great luthiers in our region that um, we're going to bring in some more luthiers to talk about with similar uh, ex their their building processes and inspirations and play some tunes with us. So keep your eyes peeled for that. That'll come on um, you know, sometime later, early in the fall, late in the summer, we'll, we'll plan on that. Thank you all, and let's hear some right. tunes. Coming G, boys. Let uh, Sally Gooden. Right. We'll play Sally Gooden in standard G tuning. Seems like a lot of people play it in cross tune A, and that's great. Uh, a lot of old time people used to play it in standard G, it seems like. You right. don't hear that as often. Here we go. <laughs>
chicken bread tray. Chicken in the bread tray, yeah. This room is uh, from Mac and I's CD, Mac and My CD, that we did like oh, 2009, something like that. A while back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it comes from uh, Ash County, North Carolina source. Um, Muncie Galtney was a school teacher, a retired school teacher that played fiddle and knew a lot about the tunes. And he recorded this from somebody. What? It came out on old originals, I believe, this mm -hmm. collection mm -hmm. of wonderful music of just ordinary people that weren't professional, they just kind of were folks that loved to play and got uh, discovered and, and found and visited and recorded and, and some of the best honest music I've ever heard and uh, we love it and I try to play those tunes, keep them going. So this is one of them called uh, Chicken in a Bread Tray. Let's see here, I'm just going to go right into this one I think. started is that you never have played all three of you. Mac and Shay have played lots and lots before, but but as a as a, the three of you haven't played together before. So. One time no, we, we played at the tip, store. Tip uh, anybody off. Yeah. Yeah. We played the <laughs> store we one time like for Friday Night Jamboree. It was like back. 15 yeah. years ago. Somebody oh, played bass. Like <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 kind of the, the, the beauty of our, of our musical tradition. Yeah, being down in Carolina, sometimes it's not fun because all of my favorite musicians, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are up here. And I don't get to play with them as much as I want to. Play a little Buffalo Gals like, uh, you got a Kyle Creed fiddle dick, remember you played that band? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Take us out, Gene. Let's see. Okay. okay. 